back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 55, The Welsh Language Divergence. All the way back in episode 38, we talked about the shadowy start of the root language of Brythonic. This language, that only existed in small ways in, in the future of Welsh, still was the main source for most people at the time. Whether it was always there, or that it coexisted with Latin, only to continue on its merry way after the end of the Roman Empire is something we can only speculate on. We can't really know for sure, although there is definitely good suspicion that that language predated what we think of as Latin. Early Welsh, however, appears to have been have its written beginnings around the middle of the 9th century, and only survives in a few inscriptions and marginal notes by scribes and holy men. The most interesting of these inscriptions is that on the memorial on the parish church of Tuin in Marianoith. It was carved circa 800 AD, and it ends with the phrase, Kun ben kulin triket nitnam, or, in other words, Kinneg's corpse dwells beneath me. This refers to the actual stone. Much like Old English, there is a faint echo of the modern language, but hardly easily understood by modern Welsh speakers. The words Kellen Triket and Tan and Nitan Mem are related to the modern forms of Kellian, or corpse, Trigo, dwells, and Dan, beneath. From the scant evidence found, Professor Janet Davis, who I've relied upon quite extensively for this discussion, suggests that Old Welsh was spoken from the mid-9th century to around the end of the 11th century. What survives untouched from the period is some marginal notes, a few brief texts, and some poems. In fact, the circuit exit memorandum is often claimed to be the earliest Welsh language text. It is an account of the settlement of a land dispute written on the margins of an 8th century gospel book. Now, two series of three-line poems, for example, were written in the late 9th century and are preserved in the marginal notes on the Uvicinus manuscript, which can be found now in the Cambridge University Library. This manuscript is therefore the earliest surviving literary text in Welsh. Also in the same library is the Computus fragment, which, written in about 920 AD, is a prose work of 23 lines discussing the methods of recording the moon's course through the signs of the zodiac. This is an important document because it shows evidence that in the 10th century people discussed complex topics using Welsh as the medium. So not only was Welsh a language of everyday work and everyday life, it was also a educational language that was taught to people in order to instruct them on day, more than just the day-to-day activities. So in other words, unlike uh, Latin's control over Roman Britain, it was both a everyday person's language and the language of academia and of administrators and all these other things, which is a major change from Roman Britain, where Latin was effectively the lingua franca or the main language that was used in order to carry out any day-to-day activities within the empire because if you couldn't write it down in latin then you couldn't make exchanges with people you couldn't communicate with the military you couldn't do the basics that you needed to do in that era but now welsh is rising up unlike its predecessor brythonic welsh is becoming the written language of the people not just the spoken language of the people And although there are a few literary manuscripts in Welsh before the Old Welsh evolved into Middle Welsh, in the years after 1100, a substantial body of literature was almost certainly composed in both the Old or Early Welsh. A 13th century document known as the Book of Anurin commemorates the attack of the Gadathan, as we have covered extensively in this podcast. Quote Dr. Davis regarding the poets of the early age, Anurin is mentioned in the Historia Brotonium, as is Taliesin, who is said to have sung to Urin, the king of Reged, Dumfries and Cumberland, in the years around 580. Anurin and Taliesin are the first of the Kinfraid, or early poets, 
singing, as scholar John Morris Jones put it, the birth songs of a new speech. They were considered to be the founders of the Welsh poetic tradition, but were themselves from actually the Old North. Indeed, if it is accepted that their work is contemporary with Urin and the attack upon Caetreth, it could be claimed that they wrote in Cumbric rather than Welsh, although it is doubtful that there is any great difference between the two languages at the time because of the connections between the two. While many scholars think that part of the poems were added at a later time period, it is felt that the main part of the work may go back to the 6th century. Recitations over the centuries may have led to the changes, so obviously, much like a game of Chinese whispers, the longer you have an oral tradition being spoken, the more likely it is that mistakes will enter in. Really, not dissimilar from the way manuscripts are written over time, and we see changes from one manuscript to another, and additions and subtractions being done either by accident or, in some cases, let's be honest, by design. Um... So later manuscripts, like the Red Book of Hergest, uh, were written about 1400, but contained cycles of poems associated with Llwar, Hen, and Heleth. The Heleth poems lament the defeat of the royal house of Powys, and, as Dr. Davis says of them, are amongst the greatest glories of Welsh literature. The defeat of Powys deprived that kingdom of the rich lands of the Severn Valley and brought the English colonizers to the edge of the uplands of Wales. It was that progress and the power of Mercia, which had by 800 AD pushed the Brythonic and its descending languages to cease to be evidenced or found in England. Uh, as we talked about before, and we'll probably continue to talk about, there were Welsh speakers on both sides of Office Dyke at this point. It wasn't as clear cut to this stage that there was a difference between the two in fact there was settlements of saxons on one side and settlements of welsh on the other and they intermingled and in fact it feels a lot like that as i said last week that the dike itself was used more of a more as a trade barrier than as a military protection point for these things with local accents and local word usage changing and the codification of written language, Welsh becomes the successor language to Latin in both communications across the country and as an administrative language being used by local officials to communicate with their subjects, be it kings or lords or what have you. As the native kings and their subjects sing, share stories, express themselves on monuments and in books and notes in Welsh, the language firms its grip in the public mindset. At this point, Welsh becomes not just a language of everyday usage, not just the language of, you know, the poor or the language of the commoner, or even, dare I say, the language of the merchant, but it is also the language of the upper houses, of the people who control things, who influence things, who spread that idea and that understanding to others. Without Welsh, now all of a sudden, these languages, or the influence of the language, suddenly becomes much more widespread. And is it's not just a language in Gwyneth, or a language in Powys, or a language in in Caragidion, or in Doivid. It's a language of all of the kingdoms of Wales, and they all speak it, and they all communicate back and forth in it to the point where others don't understand them. And it's that key point that they were exclusive in that respect, which we have to look at. How do you see differences between you and your neighbor when you wear the similar clothes, worship in the same churches, and generally look similar in ethnicity? Well, language gives you an identity. It defines you and creates a difference which is obvious to everyone. Welsh, unlike Brythonic, does, does not sound the same as what other British speakers would have spoken like. It differentiates them from all the new ways. Its establishment as a language in written form uh, allows it to become something more. It becomes the first native written British language to reach across the ages. Irish, Saxon, and Latin were languages of others, foreigners, or invaders. It wasn't the language of Britain. Welsh, on the other hand, is the descendant of the ancient language. 
whatever language it was that they spoke in the Iron, Bronze, and Stone Age, descended into what we now call Welsh. Yes, there are Celtic languages outside of that in Cornwall, and a Celtic language that exists in Scotland and that area in Gaelic. But Gaelic is actually a descendant of the Irish language. Cornish, in its own way, ceased to exist before the Normans arrived. It's only been revived, in effect, over the last hundred years. So Wales and Welsh continued past that point. In fact, Welsh continues as an unbroken language, effectively from this point on. From the 9th century until now, this language has existed, and it continues to exist this day simply by the strength and will of the people to continue to speak it, to continue to teach their children, to continue to spread that language. And because of that, because people at this point in time chose to start turning this language into a written language, using Latin as the basis, because let's be clear, the written language of Welsh is not based on some ancient form. It's based on Latin. The word usages are Latin in origin, and in fact, some of the sounds are very Latin in origin, especially ancient Latin. The hard k sound that's used in Welsh as opposed to a s sound with a c comes from a more ancient form of Latin. The concepts and way of speaking certain things sound a lot more like ancient classical Latin than they do modern or medieval Latin. So there is some relationship here between the old languages. And let's be honest with ourselves and say Welsh as a language has always adapted, adjusted, much like any other modern language, in bringing in other words from English, from uh, the Nordic countries when the Vikings come along, the Irish Gaelic languages, there's all of these word usages that do come in, French, of course, through the Normans, and they are brought into the language. Even today, scholars continue to try and build Welsh up as a language by adding words that have similarities to their origin words in other languages, of course. A uh, fine example of that is parking, you know, to, to park your vehicle. It's parkio. And that idea is, is that you're taking a, a word from another language and use, reusing it and repurposing it. But if you want a language to survive, that's what languages do. They continue to evolve. They continue to change. They continue to develop because people are willing to do it. Now, will we continue to see Welsh as the predominant language or an important language in Wales is effectively up to the people of Wales to decide. It's a language that has existed for all these centuries, all these millennia, but at the end of the day, it's up to the people of Wales to decide at what point its use is important to them. To this date, of course, we all know it's very important. It's still important enough that governments use it in their official conversations they have with the public. Welsh is still the first language of people within Wales. Is it the majority? No, we all know it's not the majority of those speakers. But at the same time, there's still enough belief in the language. There's still enough desire to speak this small little language that it's continued well past the point where Wales itself ceased to exist and then return. So in a way, this is the point where it all begins. It's all it comes down to the fact that at some point somebody said, hey, I'm going to write this language down because I want to keep track of things. I want to talk in my language, not just when I'm talking to my friends and neighbors, not just when I'm talking to the local lord or king, not when I'm talking to the local bishop or monk, but also when I'm writing to somebody who's down the way or leaving a monument to my grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren to look at. I want them to know how I spoke. And so Welsh becomes important at this point. It becomes crucial. It becomes critical to the development of the country. And so as Brythonic ceases and we go into Welsh as a proper language and we'll continue to migrate into Middle Welsh eventually after the Normans arrive and then, of course, more modern Welsh as we have now, 
Yes, there will be changes. Yes, there will be modifications. Yes, there will be influence from all of these countries and all of these people. And let's be honest, even from the changing accents, if you listen to a Welsh speaker in North Wales, they're going to sound different than somebody who's speaking Welsh in the valleys or in West Wales. All of these things influence the language in its own way, much like how the English accent is different if you're in Britain, and in some parts of Britain, they're different from one city to the next, to going to Canada, going to the United States, going to Australia, go to New Zealand, go to South Africa, and all these other English-speaking countries, and how the language has changed. You go into the Caribbean, you may not recognize or understand the English they speak, not because they're not speaking English, but because they brought in their own worst word usage, which is a tiny bit different. Conversely, if you go to Kenya, it'll be the same sort of thing. Like I said, South Africa, if you go to New Zealand, if you go to Australia, Canada has its own word usage, which is influenced by its French ancestry, and it continues to affect it even to this day where words are being used, as well as the, the native people who lived here when the Europeans got here also influence the language and change it and bring in different words that, that aren't used anywhere else. So all of these things continue to modify and change languages. And as long as a language grows, it will continue to do that. It's when it stops doing that, that it starts to stiltify and fall apart and become a dead language as we think of it. And Welsh is still growing, is still changing, is still adjusting to the modern world. And yes, it's being done by people, it's being done by academics, it's being done by politicians and government officials, and all of these people who have in their mindset the desire and willingness to continue to work in the medium of Welsh, continue to express their opinions. And I'm not talking about this, obviously I'm very passionate about this, and this is from someone who doesn't even speak the language. Um... But I think it's important, and I think it's one of the things that makes Wales unique is the fact that it's been able to keep Welsh as a language and keep it vibrant and keep it active and continue to develop it within the people that live there day to day. And I think the willingness to continue to work for this is a good thing. Now, you can argue about whether the government should be involved or whether it should be held up when it's not necessarily as useful as it may have been. I mean, I know from my grandfather, when he moved to Canada, he decided he didn't want to speak Welsh anymore. So he just stopped speaking it. He didn't use it with his kids. He didn't continue, you know, unlike a lot of other immigrants that come to the country now who might continue to use their language and continue to speak to their children in that language. He just stopped and started speaking English. And this is a guy who's from North West Wales, who lived in an area where they predominantly spoke Welsh, who completely dropped it to speak English. And that kind of development, of course, hurts the language. Of course, it hurts the influence and ability of the language to carry on. But at the same time, it's the choice we all have to make when it comes to what we talk about, how we say things, how we express ourselves. You know, there's a lot of people around the world that are having to deal with English as a language of the world. And having to make decisions as to whether or not to learn it, whether to understand it, so that it gives them an advantage in business and, and other things. And French, at one time, it could be argued, was at the same level. And Spanish nowadays is probably definitely on that level, especially in the Americas. And as well, uh, Mandarin and Cantonese are important languages to know and understand. Just as German and J but Japanese and Russian, it could all be argued, are very significant and important languages. But it doesn't mean that smaller countries' languages aren't important, aren't key, aren't critical to the world, and aren't worth preserving. So if you think that Welsh is something of a language, a dead language, that's fine. But understand that I think there's meaning and there's need, and there is a desire to keep this language alive because of how important it is to the people who once lived there and do live there now. And make mo no mistake, I think there will continue to be this battle between both sides for many, many, many years to come. I've seen it in my own country where bilingualism is a continual fight between those who speak French and those who speak English and those who speak other languages altogether, bickering and fighting as to how that should be represented. So make no mistake, I understand where this comes from, but at the same time, it is such an important 
significant language that for the history and the modern time of well of Wales, we need to preserve and we need to defend it as much as we can, at least within those communities where the language is still the first language that people speak when they're born, and it might be the last language they speak when they die. And sorry about the politicizing and a little bit of that, but this is this is one of those things where for me this is important and I think it should be important. If you listen to the Welsh History Podcast, you have to understand Welsh, not as in you have to understand how it Welsh is spoken, but rather you have to understand the influence that the language has had historically on the country in order to understand the country, because the only way the country stays unique is because of the language. Yes, there are other things that make it unique outside of that, but let's be blunt and say that literally that was what kept the country alive at one point, when it was literally just another part of England. So, again, not wanting to politicize it too much, just wanting to get a little bit of my own thoughts in there. And like I said, this comes from a person who's only an English speaker, so take that as you will. Um, but thanks you everyone for listening. Thank you for your contributions, your emails, your compliments, your criticisms, your pronunciation guides for me. Uh, I appreciate all of it, and I hope that you'll continue listening, and I hope you'll consider contributing to our Patreon, because without you, I can't continue to do this. And without your support, I certainly would not be able to do this. Thank you, everyone. We'll talk to you later. Take care. Have a nice day. Bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewelry, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.